I've mentioned in a couple previous videos that I've been planning a big genetic engineering project. It's partly why I built the new biolab, though it certainly won't be the last project. So today we're going to do two things. The first is go over the roadmap of the project and talk about what it is and what it's going to take to make it work. The second is to teach you a bit about how you go about designing a project like this. But before we get into that, what's the project and what's the purpose? Well, put simply, the goal is to make a strain of yeast produce spider silk, but really it's an excuse to go through the whole process so you can learn how something like this can be done. And since it's bio, it may take some tweaking to get it to actually work, but it'll be a great teaching opportunity and the end product will be awesome. Once we get the silk itself to work, we'll be modifying it in all sorts of fun ways, like making it mineralize on contact with seawater or glow or be fun colors. Now, already you've probably got a lot of questions, so let me give you a bit of background. Spider silk is amazing and has lots of properties that make it interesting, but it isn't actually just one material. Every species of spider actually produces many different types of silk that they'll mix and match to make fibers with the properties it wants. Some silks are very strong and stiff, while others are stretchy or sticky. As we all know, it uses these silks to spin webs, which act both as its home but also as a net for catching prey. Each of these silks are proteins, which means they're long polymer chains of amino acids, and by varying the pattern of the amino acids, the properties of the polymer changes. The silk I'm interested in is known as MASP1, or Major Ampulate Spideroin Protein 1. This is typically the strongest type of silk that a spider can spin, but it's also the stiffest. MASP2, another silk protein, is also pretty strong, but it's much stretchier. What makes these proteins strong or stretchy is how they fold, as the chain of amino acids doesn't just stay in a straight line and instead twists and turns into a couple of known shapes. These shapes are beta sheets, beta turns, and alpha helices. The strongest of these are beta sheets, and as the name implies, the chain bends back on itself and the aminos hold themselves together as a flat sheet. But purely flat sheets wouldn't have any bend to them, and would make very brittle proteins. So MASP1 silk is made of repeating areas of flat sheets connected together with alpha helices, which act a bit like a tiny spring. These give the final fibers lots of strength and enough bend and stretch that they're not too rigid. MASP2, on the other hand, doesn't have alpha helices, and instead has beta turns. These are much larger spirals that act like larger springs. They're weaker than alpha helices, but also much more elastic and bendy. So MASP1 silk is stronger, and but MASP2 silk is stretchier. Spiders mix and match these to make different parts of the web be strong or stretchy depending on what it needs. Every type of spider has its own unique silk, and so the exact genetic code and amino acid pattern is different, which is why some species' silk is stronger than others. King among these is the Darwin's bark spider, whose silk is 10 times stronger than Kevlar, which lets it spin webs up to 80 feet wide. Unfortunately, their silk sequence isn't known, and getting one is sort of hard since they live in Madagascar, so I won't be getting one anytime soon. A close second are the golden orb weavers, and these have been what most people work with. But another spider with nearly the same strength silk are ones that are found a little closer to home, the black widow. The nice thing is, since black widows are native to North America, getting some wet preserved specimens is super easy, as people use them for creepy crafts and stuff. So much so that a bulk vial of spiders only cost 20 bucks. So, we've got our spiders, now we just need to take the silk gene out and put it into some DNA that'll work in yeast. In the last video, we talked a bit about plasmids. These are small, circular pieces of DNA that are relatively easy to put into other organisms. And once inside, they start to run, just like putting a CD into a computer. There are literally thousands of plasmids, so knowing which to choose can be tricky, but I like to break it down and figure out exactly what I need it to do, and then go from there. In my case, I want four things. First, I obviously want it to work in yeast, and ideally I'd also like it to work in E. coli so I can make lots of copies of the raw DNA quickly. Then I want it to secrete whatever protein I add into it, so I don't need to pop the yeast open to get my silk. This will make extracting the silk from solution far easier. I also want the plasmid to integrate into the host's natural genome so that it makes the modification very permanent. And finally, I want to be able to select the yeast that successfully do this using an antibiotic I already have, like G418 that we used in the last video. Whatever plasmid we choose to start with is called the backbone. Now unfortunately this doesn't quite exist, but there is a plasmid that's close. It's called PKLAC2 and New England Biolabs made it. Here's the plasmid map, so let's quickly go over what's in here. The first bits are things for working in E. coli, so resistance to ampicillin, which is the standard antibiotic for E. coli selection, and an ORI, or origin of replication, which is the spot the DNA starts being copied from as the E. coli grows and divides. Next we have two areas which are labeled LAC4. LAC4 is a yeast gene, and these are small pieces of that gene. Basically, before we put the DNA into the yeast, we cut this plasmid with a special enzyme which gives us a linear piece. Because these areas match the yeast native gene, they can undergo a process called homologous recombination. 
Basically, the yeast DNA unzips a bit, and these areas stick to the areas they match. As a byproduct, the yeast cut out whatever was normally here and shoved this new bit in instead. So whatever we put between these two areas will end up incorporated into the yeast genome. However, since the DNA needs to match, this will only work in specific species of yeast, so if we want it to work with a different species, we need to change these out to match. The 3' lac region, the one on the left here, also doubles as a promoter, so it tells the yeast DNA enzymes to stick here and start turning whatever comes after it into RNA, and then into the protein we want. We might change this in the future, as this promoter is triggered by lactose, so it won't start running without it present, and I'd prefer if it just ran continuously. Right after the lac promoter, there's this tiny sequence that codes for a small piece of a natural yeast protein called alpha mating factor. The yeast recognized this, and since alpha mating factor is normally something that's secreted, it'll secrete this and whatever we stick to it. So basically, what we're doing is making something called a fusion protein, which just means two proteins stuck together into one. In our case, it'll be a fusion of alpha mating factor and spider silk. This way, the spider silk will be secreted once it's made. Finally, we have our selection gene, which is what we'll use to select for yeast that undergo this homologous recombination process. It has the alcohol dehydrogenase promoter in front of it, which is a promoter from common brewer's yeast. In the normal PKLAC2 plasmid, this is followed by a gene that allows the yeast to break down a compound called acetamide. So we can select for yeast that successfully take the DNA in by growing them on media that contains acetamide as the only nitrogen source. Since acetamide is expensive and hard to get, the first thing we'll be doing to this plasmid is removing this acetamide digestion gene and replacing it with a gene for G418 resistance that we'll be cloning out of the glowing yeast plasmid we looked at in last week's video. This will give us a new plasmid we've called PKLAC G418. This plasmid alone will be super useful, so we'll be releasing it for whoever wants to use it. Once that's done, we can add our spider silk sequence, and then all that's left to do is put our new DNA into the yeast. Here's a roadmap to show the couple of steps we'll be taking to do all of that, so now let's break it down step by step. First, we need to extract two genes from other sources, the spider silk and the G418 resistance. In the case of the G418, I already have the purified plasmid and solution ready to go, but for the silk gene, we'll need to first extract some DNA from one of the spiders. Once we've got our two donor pieces of DNA, we can isolate just the short pieces we want. We'll be doing this using a process called PCR. Basically, PCR does DNA replication in a test tube, rather than in an organism. To choose what gene gets copied, we add primers, which are short, single-stranded pieces of DNA to the mix, along with our source DNA and some reagents we'll talk about in the PCR video. During the PCR cycle, we heat the donor DNA up until it melts and the two strands fall apart. Then we cool it down and the primers stick to specific places we've targeted, and then a DNA copying enzyme in the mixture starts extending the sequence to match the sequence the primer stuck to. One primer is made to stick to the start of the sequence we want, and the other sticks to the end. After a few rounds of this, we end up with millions of copies of only the short piece we want. We'll talk more about PCR and how this works in detail when we get to that part of the series. We've already designed the primers for both the silk sequence and the G418 gene, and they arrived last week. We'll go through this design process in that future video. Before we can insert any DNA into the normal PKLAC2 plasmid, we first need to remove the acetamide gene, and to do that we'll be using two restriction enzymes. These are enzymes that cut the DNA at specific locations. In this case, they cut slightly into the start of the acetamide gene and right after. When a restriction enzyme cuts, it can either leave blunt or sticky ends. Blunt ends mean there's no overhanging DNA, whereas sticky means there's a few base pairs on either end that are hanging out. In our case, of the two enzymes we'll be using, one leaves sticky ends and one leaves blunt. And this is actually super convenient, as we won't need to worry about the two new ends sticking back together. Once we have our two DNA fragments and the acetamide removed, we can insert them into the plasmid one at a time, and to do that we'll be using a process called Gibson assembly, which we'll do a whole video on. We'll start with the G418 gene, as the plasmid is already cut open and ready to accept the new gene. We mix in the fragment we want to add in the Gibson assembly mix, which is a collection of enzymes and other reagents. The enzymes in the Gibson mix first chew back the 5' prime side of the DNA ends a fair bit. This leaves long stretches of single-stranded DNA on both the fragment and plasmid. When we designed our primers, which again, we'll talk about in a later video, we made sure to include a bit on the ends that match the plasmid we're putting the fragment into. So after the chewback, we end up with stretches on all the DNA that form two pairs of ends that complement each other. These stick together, and then the rest of the enzymes in the Gibson mix glue them together permanently and fill any holes. Once the G418 gene is inserted, we'll keep a little bit of this new plasmid for future use, then repeat the process to insert our silk gene. In this case, we'll cut with a different restriction enzyme that opens a hole at the end of the alpha mating factor gene, then Gibson in the silk gene. 
Because of the repetitive nature of the silk protein, our primers will actually make two silk fragment variants, one which is about 3,000 base pairs long and one that's about 5,000 base pairs long. Since we're not going to bother purifying these, we'll end up with two versions of the final plasmid, one with each variant of the silk gene. And just like that, we've got our newly assembled plasmid ready to go. This is why I love Gibson Assembly. It's by far the simplest and most powerful method to do this sort of thing. And it's so easy, it just takes a bit of design in advance. Technically, we could do both additions at the same time because of how specific Gibson is due to those massive overlaps we built in, but I want the empty PKLAC G418 plasmid as it's useful on its own, so we'll do this as two separate steps. And in theory, after that we're done and the DNA is ready for insertion into the yeast. When this is done, we'll have a new plasmid we're calling PKLAC G418 MASP1. I know, catchy name. One last feature I'd like to point out is something we added to the reverse primer of the silk gene. It's a restriction site, so that once we know that the silk gene itself works, we can once again cut the plasmid open and add things to the silk gene and make an even bigger and more interesting fusion protein. This could be something like a color protein, so the final silk will not only be strong, but also brightly colored. Or we can add peptides that do biomineralization and pull materials out of solution and form solid precipitates, which would be stuck to the silk. This way, the silk would harden and get coated in minerals, making a synthetic and extremely hard material, sort of like shell. If we grew enough of this, we could essentially grow bricks of spider silk in biological concrete, depending on what peptides we add. I know all of that was a massive amount of information and may seem disorienting, which is why we'll be doing this as a several part series where we go through each step in detail, and break down how we designed each part and what's going on. And when we're done and everything is working, we'll put up the silk plasmid for anyone to use and modify. Even though this final product could be worth a lot of money, I think it's more important to share it, as there's so much that can be done with it and I only have limited time. So by putting it out there for others to play with, people will make changes and additions and hopefully return the favor so we can all benefit from the next generations. And once I'm comfortable with making silk and yeast, there are so many other silk sequences to try out instead of the Black Widow silk, like those from Spider Mites, which are super weird. And maybe down the line we'll try and modify silkworms to produce these silks instead of their native versions, so that the fibers they produce can be easily spun into fabrics without the need to dissolve the silk the yeast make. Speaking of which, once we have the silk made, we'll go through the process of extracting it from solution, and we'll attempt to spin some fibers out of it. I think it would be amazing if I could grow enough to make a sweater. I want to close out with a quick bit on why I chose yeast for this project, rather than something like E. coli, which are far easier to work with. Because yeast are much larger, they can produce proteins which are also much larger, and more of them. So those two variants I mentioned earlier actually stand a chance of being produced completely, and in large quantities. Whereas if I tried to do this in E. coli, the proteins would end up short and stumpy, since the bacteria would literally run out of starting material before the whole protein got made. Remember those beta sheets I mentioned at the beginning? They're made almost entirely out of alanine and glycine, which means the organism needs huge reserves of both of these to produce silk in large quantities. This is why other groups engineered goats that produce silk proteins in their milk. Milk is also made of proteins that require huge amounts of these amino acids, so large silks could be easily produced without draining the supply. But I'm no farmer, and it's far easier to brew beer than raise goats, so yeast seemed like a good option, and other attempts in the literature showed great results in yeast. So for now, that's where I'll leave it. This project is supported in large part by my amazing patrons and channel memberships, so if you want to help it get to completion and keep the flow of open source science coming, then consider supporting the channel. And of course, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to see when I post new videos. This series will take place over the next few months, so subscribing is the best way to stay up to date. And be sure to check my other social media platforms for updates between videos. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.